The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne Chapter 13 Alice Pinchon There was a message brought one day from the worshipful Gervasa Pinchon to young Matthew Maul, the carpenter, desiring his immediate presence at the House of the Seven Gables. "'And what does your master want with me?' said the carpenter to Mr. Pinchon's black servant. "'Does the house need any repair?' "'Well, it may by this time, and no blame to my father who built it, neither. I was reading the old colonel's tombstone, no longer ago than last Sabbath, and, reckoning from that date, the house has stood seven and thirty years. No wonder if there should be a job to do on the roof.' "'Don't know what Massa wants,' answered Scipio. "'The house is a very good house, and old Colonel Pinchon.' Think so too, I reckon. Else why has the old man haunted so and frightened a poor nigger as he does? <laughs> well, well, friend Scipio, let your master know that I'm coming, said the carpenter with a laugh. For a fair workmanlike job, he'll find me his man. And so the house is haunted, is it? It will take a tighter workman than I am to keep the spirits out of the seven gables. "'Even if the colonel would be quiet,' he added, muttering to himself. "'My old grandfather, the wizard, will be pretty sure to stick to the Pinchons as long as their walls hold together.' "'What's that you mutter to yourself, Matthew Maul?' asked Scipio. "'And what for do you look so black at me?' "'No matter, Darkey," said the carpenter. "'Do you think nobody is to look black but yourself?' "'Go tell your master I'm coming, and if you happen to see Mistress Alice, his daughter, give Matthew Maul's humble respects to her. She has brought a fair face from Italy, fair and gentle and proud, as that same Alice Pinchon.' "'He talk of Mistress Alice,' cried Scipio, as he returned from his errand. "'The low carpenter man! He no business so much as to look at her a great way off!' This young Matthew Maul, the carpenter, it must be observed, was a person little understood, and not very generally liked, in the town where he resided, not that anything could be alleged against his integrity, or his skill and diligence in the handicraft which he exercised. The aversion, as it might justly be called, with which many persons regarded him, was partly the result of his own character and deportment, and partly an inheritance." He was the grandson of a former Matthew Maul, one of the early settlers of the town, and who had been a famous and terrible wizard in his day. This old reprobate was one of the sufferers when Cotton Mather, and his brother ministers and the learned judges and other wise men, and Sir William Phipps, the sagacious governor, made such laudable efforts to weaken the great enemy of souls— by sending a multitude of his adherents up the rocky pathway of Gallows Hill. Since those days, no doubt, it had grown to be suspected that, in consequence of an unfortunate overdoing of a work praiseworthy in itself, the proceedings against the witches had proved far less acceptable to the beneficent father than to that very arch-enemy whom they were intended to distress and utterly overwhelm. It is not the less certain, however, that awe and terror brooded over the memories of those who died for this horrible crime of witchcraft. Their graves, in the crevices of the rocks, were supposed to be incapable of retaining the occupants who had been so hastily thrust into them. Old Matthew Maul, especially, was known to have as little hesitation or difficulty in rising out of his grave as an ordinary man in getting out of bed, and was as often seen at midnight as living people at noonday. This pestilent wizard, in whom his just punishment seemed to have wrought no manner of amendment, had an inveterate habit of haunting a certain mansion, styled the House of the Seven Gables, against the owner of which he pretended to hold an unsettled claim for ground-rent. The ghost, it appears— with a pertinacity which was one of his distinguishing characteristics while alive, insisted that he was the rightful proprietor of the site upon which the house stood. 
His terms were that either the aforesaid ground-rent, from the day when the cellar began to be dug, should be paid down, or the mansion itself given up, else he, the ghostly creditor, would have his finger in all the affairs of the Pinchons, and make everything go wrong with them, though it should be a thousand years after his death. It was a wild story, perhaps, but seemed not altogether so incredible to those who could remember what an inflexibly obstinate old fellow this wizard Maul had been. Now, the wizard's grandson, the young Matthew Maul of our story, was popularly supposed to have inherited some of his ancestors' questionable traits. It is wonderful how many absurdities were promulgated in reference to the young man. He was fabled, for example, to have a strange power of getting into people's dreams, and regulating matters there according to his own fancy, pretty much like the stage manager of a theatre. There was a great deal of talk among the neighbours, especially the petticoated ones, about what they called the witchcraft of Maul's eye. Some said that he could look into people's minds, others that by the marvellous power of this eye he could draw people into his own mind, or send them, if he pleased, to do errands to his grandfather in the spiritual world. Others, again, that it was what is termed an evil eye, and possessed the valuable faculty of blighting corn, and drying children into mummies with the heartburn. But, after all, what worked most to the young carpenter's disadvantage was, first, the reserve and sternness of his natural disposition, and next, the fact of his not being a church communicant, and the suspicion of his holding heretical tenets in matters of religion and polity. After receiving Mr. Pinchon's message, the carpenter merely tarried to finish a small job which he happened to have in hand, and then took his way towards the house of the Seven Gables. This noted edifice, though its style might be getting a little out of fashion, was still as respectable a family residence as that of any gentleman in town. The present owner, Gervasa Pinchon, was said to have contracted a dislike to the house, in consequence of a shock to his sensibility in early childhood, from the sudden death of his grandfather. In the very act of running to climb Colonel Pinchon's knee, the boy had discovered the old Puritan to be a, a corpse. On arriving at manhood, Mr. Pinchon had visited England, where he married a lady of fortune, and had subsequently spent many years, partly in the mother country, and partly in various cities on the continent of Europe. During this period, the family mansion had been consigned to the charge of a kinsman, who was allowed to make it his home for the time being, in consideration of keeping the premises in thorough repair. So faithfully had this contract been fulfilled, that now, as the carpenter approached the house, his practice eye could detect nothing to criticize in its condition. The peaks of the seven gables rose up sharply, the shingled roof looked thoroughly watertight, and the glittering plaster-work entirely covered the exterior walls, and sparkled in the October sun, as if it had been new only a week ago. The house had that pleasant aspect of life which is like the cheery expression of comfortable activity in the human countenance. You could see at once that there was the stir of a large family within it. A huge load of oak wood was passing through the gateway, towards the outbuildings in the rear. The fat cook, or probably it might be the housekeeper, stood at the side door, bargaining for some turkeys and poultry which a countryman had brought for sale. Now and then a maid-servant, neatly dressed, and now the shining sable face of a slave, might be seen bustling across the windows in the lower part of the house. At an open window of a room in the second story, hanging over some pots of beautiful and delicate flowers, exotics, but which had never known a more genial sunshine than that of the New England autumn, was the figure of a young lady, an exotic, like the flowers, and beautiful and delicate as they. Her presence imparted an indescribable grace and faint witchery to the whole edifice. In other respects it was a substantial, jolly-looking mansion, and seemed fit to be the residence of a patriarch, 
who might establish his own headquarters in the front gable, and assign one of the remainder to each of his six children, while the great chimney in the centre should symbolize the old fellow's hospitable heart, which kept them all warm, and made a great hole of the seven smaller ones. There was a vertical sundial on the front gable, and as the carpenter passed beneath it he looked up and noted the hour. Three o'clock, said he to himself. My father told me that dial was put up only an hour before the old colonel's death. How truly it has kept time these seven and thirty years past! The shadow creeps and creeps, and is always looking over the shoulder of the sunshine. It might have befitted a craftsman like Matthew Maul, on being sent for to a gentleman's house, to go to the back door, where servants and workpeople were usually admitted, or at least to the side entrance, where the better class of tradesmen made application. But the carpenter had a great deal of pride and stiffness in his nature, and at this moment, moreover, his heart was bitter with a sense of hereditary wrong, because he considered the great Pinchon house to be standing on soil which should have been his own. On this very site, beside a spring of delicious water, his grandfather had felled the pine trees and built a cottage, in which children had been born to him, and it was only from a dead man's stiffened fingers that Colonel Pinchon had wrested away the title deeds. So young Maul went straight to the principal entrance, beneath a portal of carved oak, and gave such a peal of the iron knocker that you would have imagined the stern old wizard himself to be standing at the threshold. Black Scipio answered the summons in a prodigious hurry but showed the whites of his eyes in amazement on beholding only the carpenter. "'Lord a mercy! What a great man he be, this carpenter fellow!' mumbled Scipio down in his throat. "'Anybody think he beat on the door with his biggest hammer?' "'Here I am,' said Maul sternly. "'Show me the way to your master's parlour.' As he stepped into the house, a note of sweet and melancholy music thrilled and vibrated along the passageway, proceeding from one of the rooms above stairs. It was the harpsichord which Alice Pinchon had brought with her from beyond the sea. The fair Alice bestowed most of her maiden leisure between flowers and music, although the former were apt to droop, and the melodies were often sad. She was of foreign education, and could not take kindly to the New England modes of life, in which nothing beautiful had ever been developed. As Mr. Pinchon had been impatiently awaiting Maul's arrival, Black Scipio, of course, lost no time in ushering the carpenter into his master's presence. The room in which this gentleman sat was a parlour of moderate size, looking out upon the garden of the house, and having its windows partly shadowed by the foliage of fruit-trees. It was Mr. Pinchon's peculiar apartment, and was provided with furniture, in an elegant and costly style, principally from Paris. The floor, which was unusual at that day, being covered with a carpet, so skilfully and richly wrought that it seemed to glow as with living flowers. In one corner stood a marble woman, to whom her own beauty was the sole and sufficient garment. Some pictures, that looked old and had a mellow tinge diffused through all their artful splendour, hung on the walls. Near the fireplace was a large and very beautiful casket of ebony, inlaid with ivory, a piece of antique furniture which Mr. Pinchon had bought in Venice, and which he used as the treasure-place for medals, ancient coins, and whatever small and valuable curiosities he had picked up on his travels. Through all this variety of decoration, however, the room showed its original characteristics, its low stud, its crossbeam, its chimney-piece, with the old-fashioned Dutch tiles, so that it was the emblem of a mind industriously stored with foreign ideas, and elaborated into artificial refinement, but neither larger, nor, in its proper self, more elegant than before. There were two objects that appeared rather out of place in this very handsomely furnished room. One was a large map, or surveyor's plan, of a tract of land, which looked as if it had been drawn a good many years ago, and was now dingy with smoke, 
and soiled, here and there, with the touch of fingers. The other was a portrait of a stern old man in a Puritan garb, painted roughly, but with a bold effect, and a remarkably strong expression of character. At a small table, before a fire of English sea-coal, sat Mr. Pinchon, sipping coffee, which had grown to be a very favourite beverage with him in France. He was a middle-aged and really handsome man, with a wig flowing down upon his shoulders. His coat was of blue velvet, with lace on the borders and at the buttonholes, and the firelight glistened on the spacious breadth of his waistcoat, which was flowered all over with gold. On the entrance of Scipio, ushering in the carpenter, Mr. Pinchon turned partly round, but resumed his former position, and proceeded deliberately to finish his cup of coffee, without immediate notice of the guest whom he had summoned to his presence. It was not that he intended any rudeness or improper neglect, which indeed he would have blushed to be guilty of, but it never occurred to him that a person in Maul's station had a claim on his courtesy, or would trouble himself about it, one way or the other. The carpenter, however, stepped at once to the hearth, and turned himself about, so as to look Mr. Pinchon in the face. "'You sent for me,' said he. "'Be pleased to explain your business, that I may go back to my own affairs.' "'Ah, excuse me,' said Mr. Pinchon, quietly. "'I did not mean to tax your time without a recompense. Your name, I think, is Maul, Thomas or Matthew Maul, a son or grandson of the builder of this house? "'Matthew Maul,' replied the carpenter, "'son of him who built the house, grandson of the rightful proprietor of the soil.' "'I know the dispute to which you allude,' observed Mr. Pinchon with undisturbed equanimity. "'I am well aware that my grandfather was compelled to resort to a suit at law, in order to establish his claim to the foundation site of this edifice.' We will not, if you please, renew the discussion. The matter was settled at the time, and by the competent authorities. Equitably, it is to be presumed, and at all events, irrevocably. Yet, singularly enough, there is an incidental reference to this very subject in what I am now about to say to you. And this same inveterate grudge—excuse uh, me, I mean no offence—this irritability which you have just shown— is not entirely aside from the matter. "'If you can find anything for your purpose, Mr. Pinchon,' said the carpenter, "'in a man's natural resentment for the wrongs done to his blood, you are welcome to it.' "'I take you at your word, Goodman Maul,' said the owner of the Seven Gables, with a smile, "'and will proceed to suggest a mode in which your hereditary resentments, justifiable or otherwise,' may have had a bearing on my affairs. You have heard, I suppose, that the Pinchon family, ever since my grandfather's days, has been prosecuting a still unsettled claim to a very large extent of territory at the eastward? Often, replied Maul, and it is said that a smile came over his face. Very often, from my father. This claim— continued Mr. Pinchon, after pausing a moment, as if to consider what the carpenter's smile might mean, appeared to be on the very verge of a settlement and full allowance, at the period of my grandfather's decease. It was well known to those in his confidence that he anticipated neither difficulty nor delay. Now, Colonel Pinchon, I need hardly say, was a practical man, well acquainted with public and private business, and not at all the person to cherish ill-founded hopes, or to attempt the following out of an impracticable scheme. It is obvious to conclude, therefore, that he had grounds, not apparent to his heirs, for his confident anticipation of success in the matter of this eastern claim. In a word, I believe, and my legal advisers coincide in the belief, which, moreover, is authorized to a certain extent by the family traditions, that my grandfather was in possession of some deed or other document, essential to this claim, but which has since disappeared. "'Very likely,' 
said Matthew Maul. And again, it is said, there was a dark smile on his face. But what can a poor carpenter have to do with the grand affairs of the Pinchon family? Perhaps nothing, returned Mr. Pinchon. Possibly much. Here ensued a great many words between Matthew Maul and the proprietor of the Seven Gables, on the subject which the latter had thus broached. It seems, although Mr. Pinchon had some hesitation in referring to stories so exceedingly absurd in their aspect, that the popular belief pointed to some mysterious connection and dependence, existing between the family of the Mauls and these vast unrealized possessions of the Pinchons. It was an ordinary saying that the old wizard, hanged though he was, had obtained the best end of the bargain in his contest with Colonel Pinchon, inasmuch as he had got possession of the great eastern claim in exchange for an acre or two of garden ground. A very aged woman, recently dead, had often used the metaphorical expression, in her fireside talk, that miles and miles of the Pinchon lands had been shoveled into Maul's grave, which, by the by, was but a very shallow nook between two rocks, near the summit of Gallows Hill. Again, when the lawyers were making inquiry for the missing document, it was a byword that it would never be found, unless in the wizard's skeleton hand. So much weight had the shrewd lawyers assigned to these fables, that— but Mr. Pinchon did not see fit to inform the carpenter of the fact. They had secretly caused the wizard's grave to be searched. Nothing was discovered, however, except that, unaccountably, the right hand of the skeleton was gone. Now, what was unquestionably important, a portion of these popular rumours could be traced, though rather doubtfully and indistinctly, to chance words and obscure hints of the executed wizard's son, and the father of this present Matthew Maul. And here Mr. Pinchon could bring an item of his own personal evidence into play. Though but a child at the time, he either remembered or fancied that Matthew's father had had some job to perform on the day before, or possibly the very morning of the colonel's decease, in the private room where he and the carpenter were at this moment talking. Certain papers belonging to Colonel Pinchon, as his grandson distinctly recollected, had been spread out on the table. Matthew Maul understood the insinuated suspicion. "'My father,' he said, but still there was that dark smile, making a riddle of his countenance. "'My father was an honester man than the bloody old Colonel. Not to get his rights back again would he have carried off one of those papers.' "'I shall not bandy words with you,' observed the foreign-bred Mr. Pinchon, with haughty composure. "'Nor will it become me to resent any rudeness towards either my grandfather or myself. A gentleman, before seeking intercourse with a person of your station and habits, will first consider whether the urgency of the end may compensate for the disagreeableness of the means. It does so in the present instance.' He then renewed the conversation, and made great pecuniary offers to the carpenter, in case the latter should give information leading to the discovery of the lost document, and the consequent success of the eastern claim. For a long time Matthew Maul is said to have turned a cold ear to these propositions. At last, however, with a strange kind of laugh, he inquired whether Mr. Pinchon would make over to him the old wizard's homestead ground, together with the house of the seven gables, now standing on it, in requital of the documentary evidence so urgently required. The wild chimney-corner legend, which, without copying all its extravagances, my narrative essentially follows, here gives an account of some very strange behaviour on the part of Colonel Pinchon's portrait. This picture, it must be understood, was supposed to be so intimately connected with the fate of the house, and so magically built into its walls, that, if once it should be removed, that very instant the whole edifice would come thundering down in a heap of dusty ruin. 
all through the foregoing conversation between Mr. Pinchon and the carpenter, the portrait had been frowning, clenching its fist, and giving many such proofs of excessive discomposure, but without attracting the notice of either of the two colloquists. And finally, at Matthew Maul's audacious suggestion of a transfer of the seven-gabled structure, the ghostly portrait is averred to have lost all patience, and to have shown itself on the point of descending bodily from its frame. But such incredible incidents are merely to be mentioned aside. "'Give up this house!' exclaimed Mr. Pinchon, in amazement at the proposal. "'Were I to do so, my grandfather would not rest quiet in his grave.' "'He never has, if all stories are true,' remarked the carpenter composedly. "'But that matter concerns his grandson more than it does Matthew Maul. I have no other terms to propose.' Impossible as he at first thought it to comply with Maul's conditions, still, on a second glance, Mr. Pinchon was of opinion that they might at least be made matter of discussion. He himself had no personal attachment for the house, nor any pleasant associations connected with his childish residence in it. On the contrary, after seven and thirty years, the presence of his dead grandfather still seemed to pervade it, as on the morning when the affrighted boy had beheld him, with so ghastly an aspect, stiffening in his chair. His long abode in foreign parts, moreover, and familiarity with many of the castles and ancestral halls of England, and the marble palaces of Italy, had caused him to look contemptuously at the House of the Seven Gables, whether in point of splendour or convenience. It was a mansion exceedingly inadequate to the style of living which it would be incumbent on Mr. Pinchon to support, after realising his territorial rights. His steward might deign to occupy it, but never, certainly, the great landed proprietor himself. In the event of success, indeed, it was his purpose to return to England, nor, to say the truth, would he recently have quitted that more congenial home had not his own fortune, as well as his deceased wife's, begun to give symptoms of exhaustion. The eastern claim, once fairly settled, and put upon the firm basis of actual possession, Mr. Pinchon's property, to be measured by miles, not acres, would be worth an earldom, and would reasonably entitle him to solicit, or enable him to purchase, that elevated dignity from the British monarch." Lord Pinchon, or the Earl of Waldo. How could such a magnet be expected to contract his grandeur within the pitiful compass of seven shingled gables? In short, on an enlarged view of the business, the carpenter's terms appeared so ridiculously easy that Mr. Pinchon could scarcely forbear laughing in his face. He was quite ashamed, after the foregoing reflections, to propose any diminution of so moderate a recompense for the immense service to be rendered. "'I consent to your proposition, Maul,' cried he. "'Put me in possession of the document essential to establish my rights, and the house of the Seven Gables is your own.' According to some versions of the story, a regular contract to the above effect was drawn up by a lawyer, and signed and sealed in the presence of witnesses. Others say that Matthew Maul was contented with a private written agreement, in which Mr. Penchon pledged his honour and integrity to the fulfilment of the terms concluded upon. The gentleman then ordered wine, which he and the carpenter drank together, in confirmation of their bargain. During the whole preceding discussion and subsequent formalities, the old Puritan's portrait seemed to have persisted in its shadowy gestures of disapproval, but without effect, except that, as Mr. Pinchon set down the empty glass, he thought he beheld his grandfather frown. "'This sherry is too potent a wine for me. It has affected my brain already,' he observed, after a somewhat startled look at the picture. "'On returning to Europe I shall confine myself to the more delicate vintages of Italy and France, the best of which will not bear transportation.' "'My Lord Pinchon may drink what wine he will, and wherever he pleases,' 
replied the carpenter, as if he had been privy to Mr. Pinchon's ambitious projects. But first, sir, if you desire tidings of this lost document, I must crave the favour of a little talk with your fair daughter Alice. You are mad, Maul, exclaimed Mr. Pinchon haughtily, and now at last there was anger mixed up with his pride. What can my daughter have to do with a business like this? Indeed, at this new demand on the carpenter's part, the proprietor of the Seven Gables was even more thunderstruck than at the cool proposition to surrender his house. There was, at least, an assignable motive for the first stipulation. There appeared to be none whatever for the last. Nevertheless, Matthew Maule sturdily insisted on the young lady being summoned, and even gave her father to understand, in a mysterious kind of explanation— which made the matter considerably darker than it looked before, that the only chance of acquiring the requisite knowledge was through the clear, crystal medium of a pure and virgin intelligence, like that of the fair Alice. Not to encumber our story with Mr. Pinchon's scruples, whether of conscience, pride, or fatherly affection, he at length ordered his daughter to be called. He well knew that she was in her chamber, and engaged in no occupation that could not readily be laid aside, for, as it happened, ever since Alice's name had been spoken, both her father and the carpenter had heard the sad and sweet music of her harpsichord, and the airier melancholy of her accompanying voice. So Alice Pinchon was summoned, and appeared. A portrait of this young lady, painted by a Venetian artist, and left by her father in England, is said to have fallen into the hands of the present Duke of Devonshire, and to be now preserved at Chatsworth, not on account of any associations with the original, but for its value as a picture, and the high character of beauty in the countenance. If ever there was a lady born, and set apart from the world's vulgar mass by a certain gentle and cold stateliness, it was this very Alice Pinchon. Yet there was the womanly mixture in her, the tenderness, or at least the tender capabilities. For the sake of that redeeming quality, a man of generous nature would have forgiven all her pride, and have been content, almost, to lie down in her path, and let Alice set her slender foot upon his heart. All that he would have required was simply the acknowledgment that he was indeed a man, and a fellow-being, moulded of the same elements as she. As Alice came into the room, her eyes fell upon the carpenter, who was standing near its centre, clad in a green woollen jacket, a pair of loose breeches, open at the knees, and with a long pocket for his rule, the end of which protruded. It was as proper a mark of the artisan's calling as Mr. Pinchon's full-dress sword of that gentleman's aristocratic pretensions, a glow of artistic approval brightened over Alice Pinchon's face. She was struck with admiration, which she made no attempt to conceal, of the remarkable comeliness, strength, and energy of Maul's figure. But that admiring glance, which most other men, perhaps, would have cherished as a sweet recollection all through life, the carpenter never forgave. It must have been the devil himself that made Maul so subtle in his perception." "'Does the girl look at me as if I were a brute beast?' thought he, setting his teeth. "'She shall know whether I have a human spirit, and the worse for her, if it proves stronger than her own.' "'My father, you sent for me,' said Alice, in her sweet and harp-like voice. "'But if you have business with this young man, pray let me go again. You know I do not love this room, in spite of that Claude.' with which you try to bring back sunny recollections. "'Stay a moment, young lady, if you please,' said Matthew Maul. "'My business with your father is over. With yourself it is now to begin.' Alice looked towards her father in surprise and inquiry. "'Yes, Alice,' said Mr. Pinchon, with some disturbance and confusion. "'This young man, his name is Matthew Maul professes, so far as I can understand him, to be able to discover, through your means, a certain paper or parchment which was missing long before your birth. The importance of the document in question 
renders it advisable to neglect no possible, even if improbable, method of regaining it. You will therefore oblige me, my dear Alice, by answering this person's inquiries, and complying with his lawful and reasonable requests, so far as they may appear to have the aforesaid object in view. As I shall remain in the room, you need apprehend no rude nor unbecoming deportment on the young man's part, and, at your slightest wish, of course, the investigation, or whatever we may call it, shall immediately be broken off. "'Mistress Alice Pinchon,' remarked Matthew Maul, with the utmost deference, but yet a half-hidden sarcasm in his look and tone, will no doubt feel herself quite safe in her father's presence, and under his all-sufficient protection. "'I shall certainly entertain no manner of apprehension with my father at hand,' said Alice with maidenly dignity. "'Neither do I conceive that a lady, while true to herself, can have aught to fear from whomsoever, or in any circumstances.' "'Poor Alice!' By what unhappy impulse did she thus put herself at once on terms of defiance against a strength which she could not estimate? "'Then, Mistress Alice,' said Matthew Maul, handing a chair, gracefully enough, for a craftsman, "'will it please you only to sit down and do me the favour, though altogether beyond a poor carpenter's deserts, to fix your eyes on mine?' Alice complied. She was very proud. Setting aside all advantages of rank, this fair girl deemed herself conscious of a power, combined of beauty, high, unsullied purity, and the preservative force of womanhood, which could make her sphere impenetrable unless betrayed by treachery within. She instinctively knew, it may be, that some sinister or evil potency was now striving to pass her barriers— nor would she decline the contest. So Alice put woman's might against man's might, a match not often equal on the part of woman. Her father, meanwhile, had turned away, and seemed absorbed in the contemplation of a landscape by Claude, where a shadowy and sun-streaked vista penetrated so remotely into an ancient wood, that it would have been no wonder if his fancy had lost itself in the picture's bewildering depths. But in truth— the picture was no more to him at that moment than the blank wall against which it hung. His mind was haunted with the many and strange tales which he had heard, attributing mysterious, if not supernatural, endowments to these malls, as well the grandson here present as his two immediate ancestors. Mr. Pinchon's long residence abroad, and intercourse with men of wit and fashion, courtiers, worldings, and free-thinkers, had done much towards obliterating the grim Puritan superstitions which no man of New England birth at that early period could entirely escape. But, on the other hand, had not a whole community believed Maul's grandfather to be a wizard? Had not the crime been proved? Had not the wizard died for it? Had not he bequeathed a legacy of hatred against the Pinchons to this only grandson, who, as it appeared, was now about to exercise a subtle influence over the daughter of his enemy's house. Might not this influence be the same that was called witchcraft? Turning half around, he caught a glimpse of Maul's figure in the looking-glass. At some paces from Alice, with his arms uplifted in the air, the carpenter made a gesture as if directing downward a slow, ponderous, and invisible weight upon the maiden. "'Stay, Maul!' exclaimed Mr. Pinchon, stepping forward. "'I forbid your proceeding further.' "'Pray, my dear father, do not interrupt the young man,' said Alice, without changing her position. "'His efforts, I assure you, will prove very harmless.' Again Mr. Pinchon turned his eyes towards the clode. It was then his daughter's will, in opposition to his own, that the experiment should be fully tried." Henceforth, therefore, he did but consent, not urge it. And was it not for her sake far more than for his own that he desired its success? That lost parchment once restored, 
the beautiful Alice Pinchon, with a rich dowry which she could then bestow, might wed an English duke, or a German reigning prince, instead of some New England clergyman or lawyer. At the thought, the ambitious father almost consented, in his heart, that, if the devil's power were needed to be the accomplishment of this great object, Maul might evoke him. Alice's own purity would be her safeguard. With his mind full of imaginary magnificence, Mr. Pinchon heard a half-uttered exclamation from his daughter. It was very faint and low, so indistinct that there seemed but half a will to shape out the words, and too undefined a purport to be intelligible. Yet it was a call for help, his conscience never doubted it, and, little more than a whisper to his ear, it was a dismal shriek, and long re-echoed so in the region round his heart. But this time the father did not turn. After a further interval, Maul spoke. "'Behold your daughter,' said he. Mr. Pinchon came hastily forward. The carpenter was standing erect in front of Alice's chair, and pointing his finger towards the maiden, with an expression of triumphant power, the limits of which could not be defined, as indeed its scope stretched vaguely towards the unseen and the infinite. Alice sat in an attitude of profound repose, with the long brown lashes drooping over her eyes. "'There she is,' said the carpenter. "'Speak to her.' "'Alice, my daughter!' exclaimed Mr. Pinchon. "'My own Alice!' She did not stir. "'Louder!' said Maul, smiling. "'Alice, awake!' cried her father. "'It troubles me to see you thus. Awake!' He spoke loudly, with terror in his voice, and close to that delicate ear which had always been so sensitive to every discord. But the sound evidently reached her not. It is indescribable what a sense of remote, dim, unattainable distance betwixt himself and Alice, was impressed on the father by this impossibility of reaching her with his voice. "'Best touch her,' said Matthew Maul. "'Shake the girl, and roughly, too. My hands are hardened with too much use of axe, saw, and plane, else I might help you.' Mr. Pinchon took her hand, and pressed it with the earnestness of startled emotion. He kissed her, was so great a heart-throb in the kiss, that he thought she must needs feel it. Then, in a gust of anger at her insensibility, he shook her maiden form with a violence which, the next moment, it affrighted him to remember. He withdrew his encircling arms, and Alice, whose figure, though flexible, had been wholly impassive, relapsed into the same attitude as before these attempts to arouse her. Maul having shifted his position, her face was turned towards him slightly, but with what seemed to be a reference of her very slumber to his guidance. Then it was a strange sight to behold how the man of conventionalities shook the powder out of his periwig, how the reserved and stately gentleman forgot his dignity, how the gold-embroidered waistcoat flickered and glistened in the firelight with the convulsion of rage, terror, and sorrow, in the human heart that was beating under it. "'Villain!' cried Mr. Pinchon, shaking his clenched fist at Maul. "'You and the fiend together have robbed me of my daughter. Give her back, spawn of the old wizard, or you shall climb Gallows Hill in your grandfather's footsteps.' "'Softly, Mr. Pinchon,' said the carpenter, with scornful composure. "'Softly, and it please your worship.' else you will spoil those rich lace ruffles at your wrists. Is it my crime if you have sold your daughter for the mere hope of getting a sheet of yellow parchment into your clutch? There sits Mistress Alice quietly asleep. Now let Matthew Maul try whether she be as proud as the carpenter found her a while since. He spoke, and Alice responded, with a soft, subdued, inward acquiescence and a bending of her form towards him, like the flame of a torch when it indicates a gentle draught of air. He beckoned with his hand, and, rising from her chair, blindly but undoubtingly, as tending to her sure and inevitable centre, the proud Alice approached him. He waved her back, and, retreating, 
Alice sank again into her seat. "'She is mine,' said Matthew Maule. "'Mine, by the right of the strongest spirit!' In the further progress of the legend, there is a long, grotesque, and occasionally awe-striking account of the carpenter's incantations, if so they are to be called, with a view of discovering the lost document. It appears to have been his object to convert the mind of Alice into a kind of telescopic medium, through which Mr. Pinchon and himself might obtain a glimpse into the spiritual world. He succeeded, accordingly, in holding an imperfect sort of intercourse, at one remove, with the departed personages in whose custody the so much valued secret had been carried beyond the precincts of earth. During her trance, Alice described three figures as being present to her spiritualized perception. One was an aged, dignified, stern-looking gentleman, clad as for a solemn festival in grave and costly attire, but with a great blood-stain on his richly wrought band. The second, an aged man, meanly dressed, with a dark and malign countenance, and a broken halter about his neck. The third, a person not so advanced in life as the former two, but beyond the middle age, wearing a coarse woollen tunic and leather breeches, and with a carpenter's rule sticking out of his side pocket. These three visionary characters possessed a mutual knowledge of the missing document. One of them, in truth, it was he with the blood stain on his band, seemed, unless his gestures were misunderstood, to hold the parchment in his immediate keeping, but was prevented by his two partners in the mystery from disburdening himself of the trust. Finally, when he showed a purpose of shouting forth the secret loudly enough to be heard from his own sphere into that of mortals, his companions struggled with him, and pressed their hands over his mouth, and forthwith, whether that he were choked by it, or that the secret itself was of a crimson hue, there was a fresh flow of blood upon his band. Upon this, the two meanly dressed figures mocked and jeered at the much abashed old dignitary, and pointed their fingers at the stain. At this juncture, Maul turned to Mr. Pinchon. "'It will never be allowed,' said he. "'The custody of this secret, which would so enrich his heirs, makes part of your grandfather's retribution. He must choke with it until it is no longer of any value. And keep you the house of the seven gables. It is too dear bought an inheritance.' and too heavy with a curse upon it, to be shifted yet a while from the colonel's posterity. Mr. Pinchon tried to speak, but, what with fear and passion, could make only a gurgling murmur in his throat. The carpenter smiled. "'Aha, worshipful sir! Aha, worshipful sir! So you have old Maul's blood to drink,' said he, jeeringly. "'Fiend in man's shape!' "'Why dost thou keep dominion over my child?' cried Mr. Pinchon, when his choked utterance could make way. "'Give me back my daughter. Then go thy ways, and may we never meet again.' "'Your daughter,' said Matthew Maul. "'Why, she is fairly mine. Nevertheless, not to be too hard with fair Mistress Alice, I will leave her in your keeping.' but I do not warrant you that she shall never have occasion to remember Maul, the carpenter. He waved his hands with an upward motion, and, after a few repetitions of similar gestures, the beautiful Alice Pinchon awoke from her strange trance. She awoke without the slightest recollection of her visionary experience, but as one losing herself in a momentary reverie, and returning to the consciousness of actual life, in almost as brief an interval as the down-sinking flame of the hearth should quiver again up the chimney. On recognizing Matthew Maul, she assumed an air of somewhat cold but gentle dignity, the rather, as there was a certain peculiar smile on the carpenter's visage that stirred the native pride of the fair Alice. So ended, for that time, the quest for the lost title-deed of the Pinchon territory at the eastward. Nor— though often subsequently renewed, has it ever yet befallen a Pinchon to set his eye upon that parchment. But alas for the beautiful, the gentle, 
yet too haughty Alice. A power that she little dreamed of had laid its grasp upon her maiden soul. A will, most unlike her own, constrained her to do its grotesque and fantastic bidding. Her father, as it proved, had martyred his poor child to an inordinate desire for measuring his land by miles instead of acres. And therefore, while Alice Pinchon lived, she was Maul's slave, in a bondage more humiliating, a thousandfold, than that which binds its chain around the body. Seated by his humble fireside, Maul had but to wave his hand, and wherever the proud lady chanced to be, whether in her chamber, or entertaining her father's stately guests, or worshipping at church, whatever her place or occupation, her spirit passed from beneath her own control, and bowed itself to Maul. "'Alice, laugh!' the carpenter, beside his hearth, would say, or perhaps intensely will it, without a spoken word. And even were it prayer-time, or at a funeral, Alice must break into wild laughter. "'Alice, be sad!' And at the instant, down would come her tears, quenching all the mirth of those around her like sudden rain upon a bonfire. "'Alice, dance!' And dance she would, not in such court-like measures as she had learned abroad, but some high-paced jig or hop-skip rigadoon, befitting the brisk lasses at a rustic merry-making. It seemed to be Maul's impulse not to ruin Alice, nor to visit her with any black or gigantic mischief, which would have crowned her sorrows with the grace of tragedy, but to wreak a low, ungenerous scorn upon her. Thus all the dignity of life was lost. She felt herself too much abased, and longed to change natures with some worm. One evening, at a bridal party, but not her own, for, so lost from self-control, she would have deemed it sin to marry. Poor Alice was beckoned forth by her unseen despot, and constrained, in her gossamer white dress and satin slippers, to hasten along the street to the mean dwelling of a labouring man. There was laughter and good cheer within, for Matthew Maul that night was to wed the labourer's daughter, and had summoned proud Alice Pinchon to wait upon his bride. And so she did, and when the twain were one, Alice awoke out of her enchanted sleep. Yet, no longer proud, humbly, and with a smile all steeped in sadness, she kissed Maul's wife and went her way. It was an inclement night. The southeast wind drove the mingled snow and rain into her thinly sheltered bosom. Her satin slippers were wet through and through, as she trod the muddy sidewalks. The next day a cold, soon a settled cough, anon a hectic cheek, a wasted form, that sat beside the harpsichord, and filled the house with music, music in which a strain of the heavenly choristers was echoed. Oh, joy! For Alice had borne her last humiliation. Oh, greater joy! For Alice was penitent of her one earthly sin, and proud no more. The Pinchons made a great funeral for Alice. The kith and kin were there, and the whole respectability of the town besides. But, last in the procession, came Matthew Maul, gnashing his teeth, as if he would have bitten his own heart in twain, the darkest and woefulest man that ever walked behind a corpse. He meant to humble Alice, not to kill her, but he had taken a woman's delicate soul into his rude grip, to play with, and she was dead. End of chapter.